Okay. So we begin the session, Shrida, Tamalda? Yes, go ahead. Fantastic. Great. So good evening, patrons of City Book Leaders and I must say reading. Uh, okay. We at City Book Leaders, uh, CBL, are a new age education initiative, which is based upon a very ancient... So we begin the session, Shrida? Uh, with an ideology of... Yes, uh, go ahead. Fantastic. Sorry for this echoing. <clears throat> what I was saying... Uh, we at City Book Leaders, CBL, are a new age education initiative, uh, which is based upon a very ancient ideology of listening to texts with authors and noted thought leaders, which ancient days we used to call it Shruti. Uh, by the way, our today's session is a discussion on Tamil Bandupadhyaya's book, Pandemonium, um, The Great Indian Banking Tragedy. And that's the book we're going to talk about. Uh, I left my banking in year 2014 to pursue my entrepreneurial journey. So though I recall the banking industry till 2014, but I must admit that between 2014 and to this date, uh, this book is a great reckoner in, in an amazing thriller style storytelling. And also during all these days, we had stories from Nirav Modi or Yes Bank episode uh, that happened, but I never used to track it though multiple dailies um, and many news um, you know, was floating around it. And thus, while I found the complete case study in this book, uh, as a complete reckoner, this is just a super delight. Also, I think this book is like uh, Winston Churchill's wife, Clementine, which is about telling the truth, even if no one is asking. And that is that daring fashion that impacts the real um, um, truth that you want to hear. And this is what this book has done, especially the way the taxpayers' money has been drained out by poor functioning of many of the banks in the country, it needs to be questioned. And today to do that questioning and also to take you to this journey of this amazing book, which you cannot put down once you pick up, I would now invite our two eminent erudite guests, uh, Tamal Bandhupadhyay, the author of the book and Sridhar Sridharan, who is gonna talk about this book in conversation with the author himself. I now invite both of them to join the panel, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit. So, so Moet, uh, thank you for this platform and uh, for City Book Leaders. Uh, I think uh, you quit banking at the right time and I think literary world is lucky to have you then banking. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about it. And it's a pleasure to host uh, Tamil. Uh, I think the last few months during this lockdown, I've been telling him that I want to host him for a conversation. And finally, this book um, was a fantastic catalyst. I think it's a great uh, book to have. Uh, I, I would even go to the extent of saying probably all the BFSI companies and probably even the regulators should make this book as an orientation uh, material. Uh, I've been with the industry and I can tell you the clarity in which this book, uh, it brings very lucid view. Uh, I don't know why Tamil has, has called it pandemonium uh, because the word sounds very negative and it denotes chaos and confusion. And that's something that I will reserve for him to uh, address. But I think it is one of the sanest book about the great Indian banking. Uh, there is a mystery and aura around banking. Banking industry is always seen as glamorous. Uh, you talk about our uh, master's program, MBAs, and banking sector is probably one of the day zero recruiters as well. It has got one of the best minds. It recruits the brightest minds and has been doing it for many, many decades. And yet we have issues that keep cropping up every few years. And what is it that we could do? Again, we will uh, talk about it at length. And when Tamil Daiver says that he's not from the banking sector, I think I disagree and I would call him the ultimate insider. Uh, <laughs> with the connect and the, uh, the ability to talk about and connect the dots across banking and the associated markets, I think is the ultimate insider. Uh, what, is this, what did this book do to me? I think it has provoked the usually used statement. Don't ask, don't tell. This book has actually provoked and questioned and challenged that. It has asked and it has said. And which means this book is written about persons, personalities, processes, issues, uh, hits and misses of all stakeholders, not only about the personality's name, but it is also uh, questioning some of the lacunas in our regulations or, or the holy grail. And I think it brings about all that. And what I liked about it is this. Uh, I somehow personally feel that the people in the banking and the financial services space, we use so much of jargon just to probably highlight our own intellect. Uh, we don't need to do that. 
uh, and yet this book doesn't use any of those jargons it it simply talks to the common man uh, if you are a first year bba student you will still understand this book if you are an mba or a phd you will still understand this book i think it's a example of how we can still have an intellectual conversation without throwing jargons and one of the other interesting point that i was surprised by the book tamilda i must tell you this it has actually questioned uh, almost there are a lot of experts after they retire from their position and role they write books and commentaries questioning of why it, is it not right it should just have been fixed and i always wonder as a reader why did you not do it when you were there and this book is almost indicated or highlighted all of that without mentioning any of that of why did you not fix it when you were in charge uh and this i think you have shown it without having uh, showcasing any uh, any alignment and you have not spared anyone in that aspect so i think some of these is what i think the book really highlights uh, and what i want to leave this open to you is one thank you for this book i think you've done service for the bfsi sector completely it's not just about banking our markets have still a long way to go in terms of penetration uh, reaching to the consumer so the couple of questions i would want to highlight and then leave it to you is why the unusual don't ask don't tell you have broken that code and you've written this book which is interesting and was it something that actually triggered you to write this book any incident or person or a conversation over to you tamil okay um, thanks mohit city book lovers uh, for inviting me to join your platform and thanks to the for uh, so kind words <laughs> for me the author is good uh, so let's not have a monologue let's not me hogging the show and talking long so let me have a little bit of maybe you know 7 10 minutes maximum what was the provocation and what do i want to say through the book and then i'm happy to have a conversation with you feel free to ask anything that to the extent possible uh, within my knowledge and answer Uh, you know, it's sometime in uh, all book is a it's it's a it's a combined effort between the publisher and the author. Uh, so this book is not not an exception. Uh, publisher was excited, I was excited, and that's how that's how all books are born and created, uh, conceptualized, and then they hit the market. And so it's always um, a joint effort. But there's a one particular you call it eureka moment or whatever the moment of truth. what i want to say what was the provocation it was in october 2019 i think 15th october our uh, finance minister was talking uh, at columbia university in us and she was delivering a speech a written speech uh, uh, then there was a moderated discussion or dr arbin panagaya was the moderator and the person i think the third uh, after two persons yeah one gentleman stood up and asked her a question uh, he referred to a speech given by former reserve bank of india dr raguram rajan at brown university and he quoted the speech said that uh, dr rajan has said it's the two centralized uh, power in the government of india is that the reason for our inability to achieve the potential economic growth no the language could be different but that was the um, sum and substance of the question so our finance minister was taken aback with the question and she asked him to repeat the question so this gentleman repeated the question and then she answered she said look we have taken your time and have this question so let me answer you then pretty long answer but the short of it was what she said in essentially that i um, i think that dr rajan is a great economist i admire him as an economist i respect him but do you know that it is when dr rajan was reserve bank of india governor and dr manmohan singh was india's prime minister that was the worst time for india's public sector banking and you know we have a dominant public sector share uh, not to many countries um, comparable of indian economy uh, probably no country has that kind of share so that was the thing and somebody who was present at that conference uh, called me up real time is it tamal you you have been an observer of the industry you, you keep on writing you write your column etc etc what is your answer i was quite a i didn't know how to answer on that spot but that uh, is the proverbial set the ball rolling you know i thought why not let me so first thing i did i reached out to all past, past rbi governors now uh, that look i want to explore who is responsible for the banking mess would you like to talk to me Uh, dr rajan responded uh, dr 
uh, C. Rangarajan responded, Dr. Y.B. Reddy responded, and Dr. Subarao responded. So four of them I spoke. And I asked similar set of questions, but of course, um, and these are, these are not email interviews. Uh, uh, and I asked them like, for instance, uh, one question for Dr. Rangarajan that, are you responsible for the mess? Because during your time, we abolished development financial institutions. We embraced universal banking, but our bankers are no good at given working capital loans. So is that the, um, is that the beginning of the downfall? Similarly, the question for Dr. Reddy was, uh, during your time, the, between 2006 and eight, that was the golden era of economic uh, Indian economy, 9% plus growth, 30 odd percent uh, plus uh, credit growth. Uh, but uh, was it the irrational exuberance? Was it responsible for the mess and created, you know, after that? Dr. Um, Subarao, the question was, one of the many questions was that, uh, uh, Post Lehman, you flooded the system with liquidity. You brought the interest rate to its historic low. Then, of course, it's now even lower. But you were pretty slow in unwinding, and you so had sown the seeds of uh, of uh, high inflation, very high current account deficit, and also probably uh, the bad loans because bankers were liberal in giving loans encouraged by Reserve Bank of India. Similarly, for Dr. Rajan, one of the key questions was that were you very aggressive? in actually exposing the soft underbelly of Indian banking, because there was no IBC at that point of time when the AQR started and banks were forced to come up clean. There was no IBC and somebody within RBI said that it was like you know, driving a car and suddenly you shift the gear from uh, one to five, um, the system could not take it. So that's one of the key segments of this, of this uh, particular book. Um, where the four governors, that, that itself is a book, uh, who is responsible for the banking mess. And then, uh, you know, I have, I, have, I have discussed at length what exactly went wrong, Reserve Bank of India's fight against non-bank, against NPA, the bad loans, and how it happened, the combination of Reserve Bank of India and government of India, how they decided to tackle this, what is the inside story. Similarly, the 2018, the non-banking financial crisis, you know, we, we have seen many of the companies, or quite a few companies going belly up, the largest uh, infrastructure development um, entity, ILFS or uh, DFHL, and many more. Uh, so many felt that it was a sort of Lehman moment for India, but what I thought it was a, actually the Northern Rock moment, Northern Rock moment. It's a sheer asset liability mismatches apart from any, apart from any other thing. I also discussed the role of rating agencies, how they come, what light do they show themselves. Um, uh, and then of course, uh, the entire, the beast of public sector banking, why year after year after year, your money and my money has been, you know, has pumped into this segment, how they're doing is consolidation the panacea. Can that actually, you know, revive the industry or what? Dr. Reddy said that it's not the ownership per se, it's, it's, it's how the owner behaves. Now, should they be treated like a socio-political instrument for doing good uh, uh, to the society and to people, or should they be allowed to work as, as uh, business enterprises? Does the government have any business to be in the business of running banks? Can you run a bank like you have been running Air India? So those are the very unpleasant questions we face. And then, of course, uh, uh, what happened exactly in Yes Bank? How Rana Kapoor turned for himself, yes, bank to my bank, and finally to no bank. No, what did what kind of role Chanda Kocha played in running ICICI Bank? So these are stories of fallen angels, I say. Also, there are stories of uh, the overactivism of investigative agencies. Like, let's give you a few examples. Um, bank of Maharashtra, MD had a meeting with finance minister the previous night. Came back late night um, um, to to Pune. In the morning, on his bicycle, he goes for his usual yoga class. And at that day, there was no yoga exercises, but there was a, he was made to listen to a bhajana. And that bhajana uh, actually tells him that, him and others in the group, that be strong, mentally strong. There will be obstacles on your way, but you have to have the mental ability and equanimity to, to tackle them. From there, he goes to vegetable market, picks up vegetable, 
He comes home. Lo, police officers were waiting for him. He was picked up in a police van, and he he was arrested. And he had to spend the night in the police thana with another criminal who was arrested allegedly for killing a builder. His story: What exactly happened to him? Similarly, a former executive director of or deputy managing director of IDBI Bank. This gentleman similarly gone for a morning walk, came home and found the CBI who was searching his home, and the search continued till late evening. And in late evening, while they're leaving, they casually ask him, "Would you like? Would you mind coming along with us to our office in BKC in Mumbai, uh, Bandra uh, Bandra Kulla complex?" And then while they were leaving, he asked, "Do you? Would you like to pick up your medicines?" He, he couldn't get the hint. He did not pick up his medicine. He went to the CBI office, and then he was told, "You are under arrest." And next day, he along with few of his colleagues were thrown in thrown into that Arthur jail. Uh, the third instance of there are many more. There's yet another instance I'm talking about is Usha Anand Subramaniam, uh, who was the former MD and CEO of Punjab National Bank, and then he became the MD and CEO of Allahabad Bank. That itself is is a signal how she was treated. It's a demotion uh, from a very large bank to a very to a relatively smaller bank. Typically, uh, once you are you want you you can only go the other way from a smaller bank to large bank. But be that may it happen. And then they, the day of, of her last day in office, uh, there was a farewell being prepared at the boardroom. At five o'clock, the farewell was about to start. Uh, she was in her uh, uh, MD and CEO's room and about to leave at five four fifty three seven minutes before. Uh, uh, the mail email comes from finance minister, the uh, finance ministry saying you are sacked. So she had to pick up her bag and leave the office. Bye bye to no farewell. So these are the stories. I also I also spoke about IBC. How IBC has been panning out uh, vis-a-vis other countries. Um, are we, uh, is it doing good, better, or what exactly? And finally, what Reserve Bank of India can do? And does a regulator need new loans? So these are the uh, stories. It's stories of uh, you know, as you rightly said. Um, uh, I keep away from jargons. I you said uh, some first year student actually my ideal student is a is a school student of standard 8 i would have i would have actually said my grandma should read and enjoy it but that that would be a sexist comment gender uh, bias i'll be blamed for that so i'm not doing any saying anything like grandma or grandpa uh, but i'm saying is a standard 8 student is my 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 uh, ideal uh, reader is this if my book is only read by bankers and finance professional i think i am a complete failure as an author so i want them it should be unfolded it should unfold like a film you know um, you should you should touch and feel and see what's happening before you so that's that's the follow thing it's it's a sort of 360 degree uh, uh, what do you call it the the 360 degree view of what exactly happened at the same time also a commentary from a fly on the wall as if i was present there so that's the that's the thing that's what i i mean um, uh, a couple of other points i had i'd like to mention those who do not have the time to read this close to 150000 words there are 16 graphs one particular chapter is only graphs and charts that 16 charts actually tell the story of the banking mess what has gone wrong and some of them are quite sensational for instance we keep on discussing at various forum how public sector banks are losing their market share yes they are losing from 70% it has come to 65% but still it's 65% but do we know or how many of us know actually this 65% is a stock but incrementally in 2019 2020 for every 100 rupees of deposit which came into the banking system 80 rupees around 80 rupees actually is gone to the private sector banks only 20% 20 rupees both from for the deposits as well as loan side has gone to the public sector banks so when we say public sector banks are government owned proxy sovereign our money is safe it's so the entire the bulk of the money should have gone there but no it's the private banks who are capturing the market both for deposits as well as as well as uh, loans similarly you know we are we are so uh, focusing on so much on consolidation etc but there is a chart saying that how much how much time it takes to select a 
bank CEO in a public sector banks. Um, how many days actually the corner room uh, remains vacant? There are days between 100 days and almost uh, 275, nine months or so odd, nine months, nine months. And those 100 days were um, case where Bank of Baroda first experiment of consolidation, the Bank of Baroda CEO left and then the next CEO came after 100 days. Now, are you serious about it that we want to you know, consolidation and experiment, etc.? Then why do we keep such a sensitive position? Hundreds is vacant, and those hundred during those 100 days, the bank was run by two executive directors who were from a relatively smaller banks. So I wish I could have actually called it a great Indian banking comedy. It's not a tragedy. <laughs> you know, certain things are very comic. And, uh, and finally, um, um, uh, why you said that, well, I mean, I think, I think Mohit said why it is pandemonium, why, why this pandemonium? Many, ask this, many of us ask, this, many ask this question, why pandemonium? Pandemonium is generally, we said an uproar and, you know, it's a kind of very short leave. So there's in stadium, there's a pandemonium in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in parliament, there's pandemonium, etc. But here I have seen that in the entire, actually I picked up from Milton's Paradise Lost. It's the capital of hell. And what I, actually I was trying to link this, both this uh, uh, capital of hell in the Paradise Lost, as well as, you know, the, the fight between the Asuras and Devas, and then this Amrita Manthan with the churning out of the, of the, of, from the ocean, the Amrita was supposed to, elixir of life was supposed to come out, but then the Halahal came up. And then they needed somebody to drink the Halahal to save the world. So in this case, what I, what I try to tell is this, this Halahal is in the form of, is in the form of uh, bad loans that have come up from the churning of the banking system by Reserve Bank of India, the asset quality review between 2015 December and 2017 March, the banks were supposed to come up clean. So this asset quality review that stirred that month and brought the halahal in the form of bad loans, but they, who will consume this, this halahal? Who will become the Neil Kantha, the Siva? Is the government, will it continue to drink the poison and become a new country? Or does it pass on to, does it look for some corporate entities or some other funds or something, somebody else who is ready and capable of consuming the halahal and play the role of a Shiva? I think that's, we are all in search of a Shiva um, uh, for the Indian banking system. I think I end here. I have spoken uh, quite a bit and happy to take it forward as a, in the form of conversation. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you, City Book leaders, and thank you, Sira, for hosting me. Uh, thank you, Tamala. Before the questions start coming in, I just have a couple of questions. I thought I'll provoke it uh, while the others start raising it. Uh, you have seen this industry for a very, very long time, and uh, there is a very, very off-repeated criticism that we claim to be capitalist market-driven economy. Uh, our policies, our regulations are socialist uh, because we want to be an inclusive society. And any commentary and criticism is almost left-leaning. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about it? <laughs> so in this, your, to your point about NPAs, who is going to clear or who is going to drink the poison? The point is, if yeah. it were an open market, then they, you will also price the risk. Here, we don't want to price the risk at all. Yeah, I think it's a very complex issue, you know, even if this the votaries of privatization, those who are sort of, I call them votary or lobbyist and all, uh, that particular lobby also has, uh, has, uh, has, you know, is not as strong as it was say, two, three years back because of what happened in ES Bank. Uh, so privatization is not the, the, the right kind of answer. That's the kind of feeling here. Uh, at the same, also uh, globally post Lehman crisis, what we have seen the government had to come in even to further rescue of Citibank um, globally, I'm saying. So on the one hand, we can't uh, ignore the role of the state uh, in this particular segment, financial segment. But on the other hand, do we actually continue to, uh, to um, I mean, the, the current status quo that the government will run them and the way as, as, as uh, Dr. Reddy said, that it's not, it's not, it's not the ownership per se, it's how the owner behaves. Um, you know, basically in India, the ownership is not, uh, the regulation is not ownership neutral. You look at the way the PMJDY, it's, it's a great success story, I would say. It's the biggest uh, financial inclusion drive ever witnessed in the globe, 2014. And you look at the, uh, look at the role that played by 
private public sector banks versus private banks. Over 90% of the new deposits have been actually opened by public sector banks, uh, not the private banks. So, you know, it's, it's the entire burden of nation building, entire burden of doing good. Everything is on the public sector bank. So then at the same time, I mean, is it a, you have to take a call, either it's a socio-political instrument. Like I'm very presently surprised that they have been not involved in uh, giving, uh, running uh, you no know, COVID centers. Ideally, they should have. In a, if you see in the past what happened for everything, public sector banks, um, it's Aadhaar card. All all have been done by public sector banks. You know, they were the they were the center for opening Aadhaar cards. On a on a uh, such Bharat day, you will find your colleagues in the branches. They are coming out with, with the booms and cleaning up the uh, roads. So it's not <laughs> everything is done by them. Um, uh, by the same logic, I would I would have thought that some of the branches, uh, uh, State Bank of India, others will be asked that why don't you convert your your branches into first in the COVID center to fight and then for COVID vaccination, but they have been spared for that. So will you if you do that, then you can't expect them to continue as 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 a as a as a business entity enterprise. I think uh, after 51 years of nationalization, uh, we need to take a call. Uh, what is the character? Probably for as a as a secure as a safety or insurance again market failure. Let some of them remain in the public sector. Uh, they are, but don't then then don't treat them as as a as a business entity. And the rest of them, even though they are not in the best of health, but they are phenomenal in, uh, um, as a sort of they they have value. Their franchise value is great. There will be too many, whether it's a fund and how you work on it, that's a separate story altogether, but they have their value. So before their value gets eroded uh, even further, it's it's time, I think, we take a call. And I, I'm hopeful probably in this year's budget, we might see something. Sure. I mean, on the budget uh, point, I mean, let me extend the conversation about we have a very shallow debt market. And government of India and its entities are one of the largest borrowers in the domestic debt market. Uh, until we find a solution to that, uh, it is always going to be a catch-22 situation. What do you think on that? No, it's true. No, I mean, um, um, as far as uh, government of India is uh, borrowing, is this? This is all. This is always this year. Of course, is unprecedented. Will be close to twenty-two trillion rupees between state government and central government between twenty-one and twenty-two trillion rupees. Uh, but this is something unprecedented. Even otherwise, also government borrowing is pretty high. Uh, but that's the structural issues: our fiscal deficit and so on. Uh, what is the other option? Uh, I don't think uh, all of, any of us, or not too many of us, will be very fond of the idea of uh, government borrowing overseas, the sovereign bond overseas. It's, it's a sort of anathema uh, for India. Um, till now, we have not, we have been explored. There's some trial balloons have been done, but it, it, there was never any taker for that. We don't believe in uh, borrowing overseas. And uh, it's all, RBI uh, continues to remain the, uh, the money manager for the government. And uh, does it definitely, even currently also, the system is slush with liquidity and RBI is managing. So on the one hand, we, we have the banking system uh, plays the role of the atlas to, to bear the burden of government borrowing. And on the other hand, our corporate bond market is not, we, last 20 years we have been talking about a great corporate bond market, but that's not been happening. Um, um, you know, so uh, even off late for the past few years, both Reserve Bank of India and SEBI have been trying in RBI and they, the regulator has said the certain portion of your borrowing needs to come from the market, so on and so forth. In fact, had, had we have a vibrant corporate bond market like the development markets have, our NPA crisis would not have happened because if the corporates are borrowing from the debt market, they have no place to hide. You become a defaulter and you become a defaulter. Nobody. But here, there's a sort of quid pro quo between the banks and corporations because, because it's a win-win for both the sides. If I am a borrower, I'm not being able to pay. And if you are a banker, you also... Uh, see, there is a merit in not disclosing uh, that I am a, I, I have become a defaulter because then you Defender. can protect your balance sheet. Had there been, had I taken money from corporate bond market, then I would have, I, I would not have any place to hide. You know, my default would have been come to light instantly. One of the reasons uh, banking system had so much of NPAs and they could hide is because the over dependence of Indian corporations on the banking system. So. We need to have a vibrant bond market. We need to probably have a junk bond market also. Uh, there have been talks on that. 
um, but these are all discussions have been happening. Of course, things are far better than what it was 20 years back, but not new hair come to any developed market. Sure. Yeah, so now we have a bit. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Tonda. We have a question from Archit who was asked, uh, Indian BFSI sector looks like uh, too many cooks spoil the broth and every cook or every stakeholder has their own set of masala to add and in the ultimate uh, output, the taxpayer suffers. How do you make sense of this and what are your comments on the actual NPA recognition problem? Do you think it is solved? Uh, no, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, this question is, uh, I mean, just saying it's pretty pretty jargon-led. So, uh, simplify, I do not know what exactly this gentleman want to ask. So, the taxpayer money only goes for the public sector banks. It's not for the private banks, right? Private banks have been, uh, the times have, uh, you know, there was a time when Global Trust Bank uh, was falling and Oriental Bank of Commerce, then a zero NPA bank was forced to take over. And then Oriental Bank could never get out of this, that burden. You know, it was, it was, it, one of the reasons why in Oriental Bank of Commerce got very weak is because it was forced to, uh, to get, uh, to have this merged with itself. And that was the tradition uh, of, of the rescue, uh, the, 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 the strategy of rescuing weak banks were always like that. You get hold of RBI was a behind the scene matchmaker. You get hold of a, a strong private, relatively strong private bank uh, for a weak, uh, weak, sorry, relatively strong public sector bank to rescue a, a weak private bank. But off late, the thing has changed. Like for instance, Yes Bank is not taken over by fully by State Bank of India. It's been a consortium of banks where, where even private banks also participated. Similarly, LVB, Lakshmi Vilas Bank, where we got this uh, um, DBS. Uh, yes, DBS, India, India subsidiary of DBS it took over and all. So where is the tax over my taxpayers' money there? Uh, there are various entities, and there are um, there are entities which should not, like for instance, Rana Kapoor should not have given a banking license or should have been caught much earlier, uh, but has lost taxpayers. Yeah, tier two bondholder lost money, but taxpayers have not lost money there. Uh, similarly, LVB also. So there are, I mean, there are issues in terms of um, in terms of the way uh, we have handling it. But one way of looking at it, uh, nobody. Um, was allowed to fail except for some of the cooperative banks um, which is of course a different uh, kettle of fish altogether but among the uh, scheduled commercial banks since economic liberalization not a single bank has been allowed to fail but what happened is the the way they were allowed to function that needs to be whether it's ILFS you know ILFS uh, you you run such a large entity for, uh, for to play the role of a catalyst for uh, infrastructure uh, building, but what role actually it has played? I mean, nobody questioned that. There's absolutely no responsibility. And the CEO ran the company like it's like a promoter as if his own empire. And then he left like a promoter. And, and the, all the stakeholders who were on the board, what role did they play? So we allowed ILFS to get into such a gigantic proportion uh, and not following any of the norm. And we, we also allowed it to fail. We could have saved it. In 2000, when UTI, then India, I mean, the, um, India's oldest um, uh, mutual fund was saved with electrifying right. speed. And that it was, a, it was small in today's context, but in 2000, it was pretty large. But you see the way uh, it was saved. Um, you know, the, the CEO was sent to jail and uh, the government chipped in and everything worked out within 72 hours. Everything was in place. But ILFS, you, you were planning for, you know, it was allowed to look for a rights issue. A rights issue already opened. And then you pull the plug. Why? So it's, it's quite a mysterious thing that happened. Why did we allow Yes Bank, you know, the wound to fester so long? Everybody knew that the Rana Kapoor was, was running the bank the way should not have been, uh, any bank should not have run. It was Yes Bank became his bank, own bank. But then we allowed this to happen. So the, the whether it is Yes Bank or whether it is ILFS, uh, all these things, we, we allowed this. Uh, so I don't know whether this question of too many cooks uh, spoil the show. I, uh, I, don't, I don't understand that. But the fact is, uh, there have been cases where entities should not, have been, should not have got the license to run business they have got. And there have been cases where uh, they were not running their business the, the way they run, but they were allowed to. They are given too long a rope. And public sector bank is a completely different cup of tea uh, because 
it is still uh, continued to be run like a like a socio economic instrument for doing good uh, for you and for me not as a business entity Sure, I understand that. So that uh, the social uh, development uh, infrastructure entity brings to the point about DFIs. So this is a question from Mohit. Early nineties, uh, uh, the DFIs were phased out, and uh, if you look at the, some of the data trends, the uh, asset liability mismatch in the market also started around the same time, and there was a huge euphoria of running into uh, the retail banking. Uh, and globally, when we saw the Cold War was receding, and countries, I mean, globalization started happening. but who would you think if there were one single uh, person or uh, stakeholder who do you think was responsible for this basic mistake of uh, breaking up the dfi no yeah, you know i don't know whether it's a mistake because if you see in fact that was the time when i started um, i started bank reporting 1995 when dr rangarajan in his last leg uh, uh, as an rbi governor and then he was bringing down the pulling down the wall between the banks and and development financial institutions now there was a regular deregulations and all these things were happening at a at, a, at an electrifying speed and then we embra- we embraced uh, we embraced uh, uh, universal banking you know the banks will do everything and the dfis in fact one of the key that rather the key reason the dfis could not survive any more because of asset liability mismatches um, for instance icici was running huge asset liability mismatches you know on every bucket uh, bucket i i still remember uh, mr kamath who was who was the head of icici Uh, not the bank, but the ICICI's DFI and his team. They he made a presentation to Reserve Bank of India. Um, why it should because uh, why it should become a bank because they were getting money from the government as a concessional rate, and the government closed that tap, and then they were they did not know what is to be done. So one of the reasons why DFIs had to had to close shop uh, is the. Uh, is because of the increasing asset liability mismatches they could not have survived so icici first bite the bullet and icici got merged with uh, itself with the icici bank and later of course idbi also followed suit ifci never did anything but does it's it's still in a coma sort of thing it's it doesn't do anything and there's another entity iibi in Kal- kolkata it got uh, it got owned up much earlier in 90s itself if i'm not mistaken so the banks were taking um, the responsibility of doing uh, doing everything a universal bank meeting everything uh, all need and they they all uh, tried to become a life cycle bank like i'll catch somebody from with education loan and then i'll give you the car loan they'll give you the home loan they will give you a holiday loan and then personal loan then your child's education loan so on and so forth everything you do and then 2000 came the Uh, came the um, uh, the retail the first sign up you know the retail banks entry into retail and kamath is the retail guru in indian banking everybody started uh, whether is auto loan or home loan everything and if you see all these things continued till the till the uh, lehman lehman thing happened and after that there was a change and that change this post lehman the entire liquidity slash and the banks were encouraged to lend and there is a pressure from the government for infrastructure building infrastructure so on and so forth so all these things contributed there it's not a i don't think there's a single villain of this who ha- who is responsible for that and then you will find that in this the past decade you know suddenly uh, it's a very very funny thing you know first of all the policy the banks followed hard mentality you know which state bank can do uh smaller banks cannot do but because state bank is or is taking respond is taking uh, getting into project financing everybody else has to do that that's how it happened and I, in my book also i spoke about how sbi caps played a very critical role you know is because there's, there's a clear conflict of interest which i am not saying which which reserve bank of india has observed because the merchant banking arm of the country's largest bank it was doing uh, it was hawking loans doing loan loan syndication and also doing the project appraisal so one it appraises the project and sbi picks up a stake in that thing in the debt it hawks thing to everybody else that look sbi has come you will miss the bus you, you please come you please come and get into this and then irrespective of all the other banks they are very different in shapes and size in capability but a, and and risk taking ability but because it is appraised by sbi caps and sbi is there everybody else also joined in in fact there is a mckinsey report i think it's 2017 or 18 something like that it says the smaller the bank the larger the exposure to corporate loans 
you know much smaller so That's what true. happened what happened in the first decade from uh, you will find that the banks are saying we are de-risking from our corporate loan we are getting into more and more retail post lehman in the second decade you will find that you will see that we are de-risking we are now getting into more corporate loan and less retail loan and towards the end of it last two three years you have been talking about we are de-risking we are getting into more corporate loans <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a very it's a very fine in the process what is happening is this many of the banks are making them irrelevant and some of the private banks which are better managed and better governed they are making rapid strides and that's the new landscape is happening yeah so in that question I mean, there's a very interesting question from ranjit uh, he observes that during the growth phase china had uh, nearly 60% npas with certain institutions and he feels that that's a price a country probably has to pay and he feels that india is discussing too much of npa in lieu of growth and what do you feel about this no you know I, um, the point is the china's numbers nobody knows whether it's even 60% or more than that we don't know so that's a separate <laughs> separate story altogether but in our case what is happened is this uh, uh, i mean one way of looking at it this you will get into npa and you clean it up and you start a fresh and then probably a decade later again you will get into the same thing which happened in india also you will find that we had 14 15 18 19 20 percent npas in the late 90s and then we 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 made the cleaning up saying and all and then we came up and now again you uh, know we had uh, we had npa we came up we, we came it's came down now uh, in single digit uh, and now we'll go up again but the point is you know it's a combination of many things uh, it's a combination of many things which had led to that and the banks it's a sort of credit misallocation so the banks were they were not they were not good at risk management they are not good at appraisal and they were not good at monitoring i am not saying the entire banking system but many of the banks and so they just tried to shift the asset classes you know mm. from 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 infrastructure to power to telecom so you burn your finger and then you shift and in this way and some day you will find that there is nobody to lend except for the government so that's the ultimate of credit, credit misallocation so do we encourage that or do we actually uh, you know uh, look at the mirror and we see that look we can't do this and better change the way we 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 function and do the corrective measures so that's the thing uh, and there are multiple stakeholders here it's not the Uh, i mean it will be very unfair if we if we just pass uh, you no know, blame the only the public sector bankers so you have to see the compulsions we have to see uh, the environment in which they work we have to we have to see how the government uh, played a role we have to see the how the environment ministry and judiciary played a role uh, so everything everything else no it's not a it's not a straight answer it's a very so china is a different story altogether because of their uh, i mean their administration is very different i am not getting into that what is good or what is bad but uh, in our case uh, entire story is a very complex story but we need to take a call do we continue to have this credit misallocation will uh, should we allow the banks to shift from one asset class to another until they burn their fingers from telecom to uh, infrastructure to power so on and so forth and then ultimately one day they will only stare uh, look at only the government is the only you know entity which what Uh, giving money to and nobody else do we allow this to happen or do we take corrective steps the way this function the banks functions and do we change the environment in which they operate i think this is the time to do that and we have decided that we, we need to change that's why we have ibc that's why we have we have uh, reserve bank of india aggressively telling banks to clean up the system so on and so forth um, so that that's it Sure. I mean, so there are uh, here a couple of uh, questions and very interesting uh, coincidence that our viewers have raised. That one of the questions from Sir Ramaswamy is there are huge payment outstanding by government corporations like NHAI, and the impact on banks when their borrowers are affected by such payment defaults or payment delays is huge. Uh, somebody is paying the price for that. 
Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, in fact, um, NHI also can't escape its role in the in the ILFS uh, tragedy or fiasco, whatever you call it. Tragedy, I, I think, giving too much of actually dignity to ILFS is not a tragedy. It's a mismanagement, whatever you call it. But yes, NHI is a villain there, and my book talks about that. So definitely, when I said there are many stakeholders, it's the way the government manages things, the way the environment ministry, the judiciary, the legal issues, and uh, NHI also cannot shun its responsibility where, where does and how how why, why doesn't it pay it's not so it is i mean it, it is it, it's it's a quite a mess and um, again um, i'm not marketing my book but i did mention i did mention the role of nhi there also so do you think uh, very no hypothetical question let's say a government entity delays payment do you think mm -hmm. a private sector vendor can actually take them to ibc and do you think media will cover it very fairly I mean, I don't know. It's a hypothetical question, but why? I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I, does IBC prevent anybody, any government entity to be dragged into court? I don't know. I don't know the fine print and all. But if it does happens, and why would not media? Uh, why would not media? I, I don't. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, because I don't prima facie, I don't see in a, in a like media has any bias, anything not to do or anything like that. I would like to believe that when if certain things are not covered by media, it's because we are not in the know. But um, we are in the know, and we do not want to cover because we play to that uh, you know to, in the hands of certain vested interest, or we have been restrained by our management not to cover. I don't be. I'm not. I don't believe. In this that. Uh -huh. I uh, think that we we cover it. But being an industry person, you and many bankers may feel that in my career also. I don't have an active journalism career. I've given up long back. I'm a sort of becoming a rather armchair commentator, you can call me, or, or an author or writer <laughs> books and all. But I tell you, in the heart of heart, I'm still a journalist, is this. Many of the things bankers say, look, you are not covering this, you are not covering this. But we don't know this. We don't know this. But many of the unpleasant things we do cover. In my column, uh, right. every week I do write. And in my book also, you know. So it's not that we are, and I am a representative of media. So I think that's how the media... Uh, uh, media operate. We we don't write because we don't get to know, or we will not be able to substantiate, or we'll be pulled up for legal issues which can't defend. But if tomorrow you take the uh, you you give me uh, real information, um, and you, I I am pretty confident I can defend myself. I'll write anything uh, which needs to be written. So I think for a deeper, nice market, a mature market, uh, I think a robust media with a combination of uh, investor activism has always played an important role for consumer protection. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's India is also getting there. Yeah, uh, this, so, this uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi Vilas Bank is one case where I think the investors' activism also played a role there. In fact, before the AGM happened, uh, some of the entities, or at least one particular entity which takes care of investors' interest, actually flagged up certain issues. And of course, media did write. Yeah. So, so the next question is from uh, uh, Rajesh, who's asked, uh, who said that, uh, thanks for writing an insight, insightful book. Uh, my question is, what ails the cooperative banks? And do you think they possess a systemic risk? risk see cooperative bank is a is a is an is a sort of animal which is a which is a very different and uh, if you see uh, from uh, from economic liberalization not a single uh, what do you call it the scheduled commercial bank has been allowed to fail uh, every bank your money and my money is safe in every scheduled commercial bank but that is not the case with cooperative bank cooperative banks have been allowed to fail uh, many many banks. They are, either they failed or they are has been cancelled, etc. etc. Uh, the latest high profile case is TMC. I don't want to get into all the details. And before that, you have the Madhapura, which is a big case. Uh, it happened uh, many years back, and then in between, because they are essentially a political animal. The way the cooperative banks operate, it stinks. Not all the banks. Let me be honest. There are some. There are very large cooperative banks. They are technically, uh, technologically pretty savvy, and they are good. But there are many, many banks, or other many of the cooperative banks are not well run. There is a quid pro quo. There are there are lots of issues in terms of it's basically misgovern. They are not governed well. Um, uh, it depending on which region, uh, political power plays a very critical role. 
uh, in Maharashtra will be something else, something in West Bengal there will be something else, in Bihar there will be something else and all. So basically, I mean, um, it's it's a political animal and it's a very complex animal because Reserve Bank of India has all along been saying this is a dual control because the state cooperative um, also there, etc. So now uh, it's been changed and Reserve Bank of India wants to take the responsibility of uh, uh, all the, I think the amendment, uh, not I think, the amendment is, is being done and RBI will take, uh, RBI will take uh, greater responsibility in terms of regulation and supervision and also RBI is encouraging them to convert at least some of them to convert into small finance bank in fact as we speak i think on friday was it friday or is yeah it's friday the first case of a cooperative bank being converted right. into small finance bank that's right it happened so i think this 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 is a very vulnerable thing can they can they create a systemic risk no i don't think so i don't i don't have the numbers on my on my uh, my on my table uh, but systemic risk is may not be the case but um, there will be many, many cooperative banks, maybe many more cooperative banks will fail. So we need to be careful. Many of us feel very comfortable um, in keeping money because of convenience, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I, I think that this is the time to take a hard look at the cooperative bank. As a customer, I think we need to, because there are there are banks, there are public sector banks, there are private banks, there are small finance banks, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you need to have keep cooperative money? Uh, in the banks with the cooperative banks. I do not understand. When we know that the nature of the beast is very different from the from the from the normal uh, commercial banks. That's true. So we have another question now uh, very interestingly about the new uh, uh, inter update that the Assam bill on microfinance and uh, <coughs> NBFC NBFC MFI. Uh, what is your view on this and what and also about the political interventions? No, it's Assam, um, Assam microfinance bill. I have, I, I have read you commented about it recently. Yes, 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 yes. Is is a read the bill. So what happened is, you know, this is in 2018, and uh, there was certain uh, local entities. They started raising the issue, and there's a particularly four districts in in Upper Assam, which is um, uh, primarily the tea garden workers. Uh, they are being, uh, they are. Being in, they were encouraged by the lenders to over leverage themselves. They are apparently given money, um, tons of money which they cannot service. And then there was a pressure from the lenders uh, to, to, uh, to collect the money. And that created a sort of the ruckus and that happened in the much before the COVID. And, and there are some student organizations and there are some local organizations who are actually finding trouble, etc. And then now what happened is this, now the issue has been hijacked by the government ahead of the elections. And meanwhile, the, the, the Congress party said that they will go for... Uh, which is the easiest thing to do in every election, every state, uh, the lenders run the risk of being the loan waiver, which the, already they mentioned this. And Assam, right. Assam, Assam finance minister also, I think, handed, uh, hinted about a loan waiver. And meanwhile, this uh, this uh, microfinance bill came. Now, I have been through the bill. Now, what they're saying that this microfinance bill is applicable, he said, to whoever is lending money, including the companies which are governed by Companies Act 1913. It does not talk about banks. Now, what does it mean? The company, uh, the, all the private banks are also governed by the companies at 1913, whether right. they are whether they are listed or unlisted. So, pr private banks are coming under this, but not the public sector banks, not State Bank of India. So, they are out of it. That's 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 who, who is applicable. So, it's applicable to all non-banking finance companies, all NBFC MFIs, all trust MFIs, as well as all the private banks and small finance banks, so on and so forth. That's all. Now, which are the two critical elements which would, which would actually create problems or um, the industry should be aware of or take note of? So, the issues like uh, it sh you should not allow them to over leverage. You should not go beyond 1.25 lakh of giving debt. You should not give them more than 50,000. The, the the workers in the tea gardens who do not have uh, multi uh, those who have multiple sources of income for them, I think 50,000. Those who have single source of income, 30,000. So on and so forth. Uh, uh, Mm, it does not talk about interest. It says that you follow the rules of Reserve Bank of India as far as interest rates is concerned and collection is concerned. So all these things, my understanding is this industry has already been following, be it banks or be it NVFCs and all. Probably they were 
a little adventurous in 2018 but in the meanwhile in the last one and a half years they corrected their ways so on and so forth so they will not come in their picture it's not saying that you cut down your interest rate it's not saying that um, you you close shop here but what are the two things two critical things which will actually impact and they need to negotiate and tackle is this one they are talking about a local registration you have to register yourself with a local authority those who are already here operating and those who want to come in each of them the registration will be valid for 2 years before 60 days of registration is becoming you know expiring you have to apply for it so on and so forth and if borrower complains against your operations the entity the registration authority will cancel your registration of course informing you now can you can you uh, subject all the lenders to do to this i'm coming to that uh, but the, and the second so this will this will come on the kind of thing because it will it will it will create bureaucracy delay so on and so forth and second part which is again which will affect the business is this they are saying the collections have to be done at local panchayat offices or certain places designation by the government now second part also can become a little politicization of issues like why do you have to do the collection at panchayat offices so a it runs the risk of politicizing things and b it also against the spirit of digitalization after after actually after this covid everybody is is looking for digital uh, you know uh, more and more digitalization uh, um, so when you are when you're talking about the physical collection you are actually violating the spirit of digitalization now can they be applicable etc uh, the first part which is the re local registration part probably can be applicable because what the norm says that uh, the banks are governed by the central acts which is reserve bank of india and banking regulation act 1949 so if there is a clash between a local act and a central act the central act prevails but this local registration is is not a clash as such it's only a sort of uh, uh, the formality which for instance the shops and establishment act uh, the bank branches are in certain states they they are they are required to register themselves under the shops and registration act it does not come on the way you do the business so i as in i don't have the last word because i am not a legal person i would think that state law can force everybody including banks for the local registration from this but panchayat office can they do it they cannot do it because it is not a venue for business for a bank so definitely yeah. the banks can challenge it it cannot be done but can the mfis and the other lenders escape it probably not if they follow this rule probably so it's it's a law now it needs a gov governor assent uh, to become uh, it's it's a bill now it will it's become a, bill, a yeah. law uh, after the governor signs off so uh, it is it is not exactly a very happy situation uh, but is it as bad as 2010 uh, andhra pradesh law uh, which nearly nearly killed the industry not not that because it's not as restrictive and as aggressive as the ap that is one part of it uh, and the other part of it is this at that point of time in 2010 25% one fourth of the microfinance industry was in in ap andhra pradesh and right. here here in assam the exposure of microfinance not microfinance entities the microfinance that micro loan which inclusive of banks is just about 5% About eleven thousand crore or close to twelve thousand crores, the micro loans there, fifty percent of which by banks and fifty percent by the micro lenders. So it's not going to it's not going to impact in a massive way, I would think. But I think there's a scope for negotiation. There is a scope for discussion. I would like to believe the Reserve Bank of India should step in. There are two SROs for the industry. They should step in and and prevail on it. they should commit responsible lending which they have already committed i believe That's true. now we, we we need responsible politics also too thank you yeah, because but the before, worry be, yeah before elections it's this, it's this is a, had there been no elections i would have i would have thought that it's it's much easier to tackle but because of elections there there's a compulsion of pressure from the administration also to do something for the voters that's right that's worry right because you're uh, educating yeah. the other states of what you could get potentially get away uh, and it could be a much larger proportion of the industry there so i'll Correct. quickly move on in the interest of time the last three questions uh, one uh, manish asks what's your view on payment banks 
and he yeah. feels that it has been abandoned as a concept after dr rajan left yeah i i i don't i don't uh, i don't think it's an abandon i think it's a failure it's a failure because the payments bank does not have any business model you tell me what what can a payments bank do which a normal bank cannot do a normal tech savvy bank like a, say kotak or hdfc or axis or icici in the private space or state bank of india and bank of baroda in the public sector space what can it do which a payments bank cannot do it can uh, it, they can do everything payment bank uh, so the very business model of payments bank is a faulty which is why you will find that 11 entities got the license but not everybody went to set the set up operation uh, and even there are entities after operationalization they surrendered themselves Correct. and the biggest payment bank uh, in india which is uh, i'm not talking about the india post but i'm talking about paytm paytm wants to become a normal bank which Correct. is the bank of india said they will initially they said five after five years now they're saying after three years so i think rbi has tacitly accepted payments bank model is not feasible in indian context so i think i think those who are already operational many of them will get themselves converted into or some of them will get them converted into into a normal bank which is sfb and some of them like the telecom operators i think they need to have a uh, payments bank because it's a support for their uh, customer base so bank bank per se i don't think they have a big big faith in the banking model but you need them uh, you know uh, you, to keep your customer base intact so that's that's the limited utility of payment bank so it's a, um, i don't think it's abandon it's a failure and rbi has accepted, has accepted that it. Yep. yep so there's a question from babu who's asked what are the non political steps the government can take to strengthen the bank and here i just want to comment before i leave it to you and the same statement non political and government doesn't go well together at all uh, probably meant the regulator no i i'm uh, i'm can you just repeat the government stigmini he is talking about babu is talking about only the private uh, uh, sorry the public sector banks right that's uh, what the i mean generally he's talking about the overall banking system how do you strengthen the overall banking system with non political steps that the government can take no 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 the 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 only way of strengthening the banking system is is to have more and more capital if you look at this the bank of india's uh, six monthly uh, uh, the the whatever we call it, the health check which came yesterday it spoke about the npa gross npa doubling almost doubling between from september 2020 numbers by september the next 21. year that's right yes it's almost doubling and this doubling of npa will make many banks pretty vulnerable on the capital front because if you have large npa you have to provide for and that comes from your capital and once you have that then then um, you know basically is capital erosion it makes you forget forget the growth capital even the survival capital you probably need uh, to the extent possible i mean to the extent your npa for that so it's not political or non political banks need tons and tons of capital banks need to be well governed the government should follow a hands of policy and in private bank in the private bank like rana kapoor kind of uh, pay person should be detected first and should be uh, dealt with according to the law so these are the very simple things the politics do not come here at all but the problem is as i said uh, um, uh, can the government afford to keep on pumping money you know there have been this, in fact i don't need to tell you you go back to the economic uh, survey which comes just the day before the um, before the budget, budget. Um, the last economic survey spoke about how much money had the had this money the the kind of uh, capital the government pumped in you know had it been in a nifty bank index how much money would have been it have made more and how, and how much how much it had come like for instance the the us and uh, the, the i'm talking about not, not forget all the jargon the money that us government pumped in the us treasury post lehman they actually made profit that's right it. yeah it, it's not it's not going down the drain but here particularly after this covid year the the technical recession and the higher fiscal deficit where will the money come from so it's high time the government needs to take a call probably a selling of the stake and getting some money to manage their fiscal deficit better so is it politically acceptable issue no because uh, many of us think that banking is a noble profession and um, you know banking is not a noble profession banking is a business we we need to treat that 
yeah. see unfortunately what uh, the regulator wants is patient capital and what we have seen in markets with npas and issues is the capital is a patient uh, so unless we open it up we are not going to solve this conundrum at all every year we'll have the same conversation about recapitalization and more and more creative financial instruments are coming in the recap bonds which is also tricky Uh, so the, the question that shri ram is asking is this uh, where is the need uh, with so much of learning over the decades by the government and rbi in the banks and the issues what's the need for more licensing of more banks and what do you feel about corporates to be allowed in the banking business so a uh, we need definitely we need more bank because we have a very repressive financial society is a very repressive financial system we definitely need more banks now even though the pm jdo is a great success over 30 what 30 crore uh, people have got access into banking but there are if you if you travel in the hinterland of india you will see that uh, banking we need more banks we need more competition because our banks most of the banks go to the rural areas villages under compulsion they don't see it is business because there's a priority sector lending 40% they need to give it to the so called weaker section of the society they need to see it as a business you know and with technology now disrupting the entire thing i think there's a huge opportunity opening up is our state um uh, risk covers uh, public sector banking large banking public sector banking industry and with all the constraints they have the unionized Uh, employee force etc can they go and do this they can they cannot so we need more and more banks so on that question there is no uh, there is no uh, the answer is only one yes we need more banks in historically 1994 we got 11 banks including one one dcb one cooperative banks converted into a full fledged bank not all of them survived after 10 years 2004 we got two banks yes bank and and kotak bank another 11 years 2015 we got two banks bandhan bank and ibm and then in 2016 we got 10 small finance banks and 11 uh, 11 payments bank not all of them survived and all we need more banks now um, on that question there is i said there is only one answer will the corporations be allowed there's a lot of discussions uh, as we speak reserve bank of india's you know feedback window closes on 15 january and then rbi will take a call and rbi uh, internal committee spoke about allowing corporations now were they not allowed by subarao during this uh, 2015 uh, licenses where idfc and 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 bandhan was allowed they were allowed also uh, but they did not get it some of them applied and then they withdrew like tatas withdrew uh, then and a few other entities withdrew uh, and then uh, who had applied for it they did not uh, uh, they did not get it now the question is if you see after that there are there are i think mr kamath is one person who has said yes uh, to corporation but many including dr subara am uh, including uh, viral acharya and uh, um, raguram rajan they said no so there have been discussion after the credit policy uh, one question at the press conference there's a question and and rbi governor almost disowned the report he said no it's not an rbi report <laughs> it's an rbi committee report internal committee report so no so why they are not why they are saying not allowing corporate because corporations are responsible for the banking mess they took the bankers for a ride they did not bring their equity they used banks money both for debt and equity now will you allow them to run the banks that's that's the thing they are the villain of the piece will are, are the kind of thing and all so that is one issue but the larger issue is this i think i would see this this way that can rbi tackle them rbi run the risk of being outsmarted by rbi cannot tackle a rana kapoor rbi cannot i mean figure out what rana kapoor was up to much earlier at the right time rbi uh, even an individual like rana kapoor or say ramesh gilli took the regulator for a right so rbi run the risk of being outsmarted so i think the more critical part is this rbi needs to acquire the right kind of strength as a regulator and supervisor then we should we we you think about it in fact if you see there's a caveat that provided rbi also has its bandwidth as a sort of regulator and supervisor correct correct i think that i think the larger issue whether we should allow them and can we, because you know if i am a corporate actually why do i need a bank i can manage the banking system i have done this in the past 10 years i got money i did not bring my equity i was managing the bank's money both at equity etc etc so i am a smart and clever uh, corporate entity i would not need a bank anyway i can manage the banking system so i think the larger issue is this 
a regulator becoming smarter when it comes to uh, regulation and supervision then we should think of it so my understanding is this probably you need to wait and watch yeah sure uh, the other the, let, let's say we are population is younger the millennials generation z whether they are live in <coughs> interland india or urban population and we are more a uh, keypad literate indians than literate indians uh, that's a uh, proven statistics and we also see a huge amount of capital inflow into the digital startups i mean they all are piling on the india stack story and uh, using the jam trinity but if you look at most of those entrepreneurs and founders uh, uh, let's say from the regulatory regulatory lens ye uh, sab bachche hain they're all 35 and 40 year or probably even 30 years of age Uh, and that's when suddenly you see a huge hierarchy what i uh, paraphrase it as the banking brahmins uh, you have the bankers who are 55 who have done conventional brick and mortar banking if they apply for a license or one of them uh, are made the chairman and they apply for a banking license they are seen but you bring in a tech player with tons of patient capital with backed by let's say technology company and a good robust board uh, there still seems to be an hesitation is the feeling Uh, when when do you think we'll actually overcome that digital chasm we talk about digital from the government side policy side but here there's a huge gap is yes, there i think whether we accept it or not we just can't we can't we can't keep our eyes closed anymore because um, what demonization cannot do could not do after demonization there are some you no know, philip to digitalization but then it petered out but post covid uh, digitalization is here to stay in fact nandan nilkani mm-hmm. has recently said what would have taken for years now it's happening in weeks correct okay, that's one now a lot of things in the happening in the payment space in fact india is probably the most exciting yes. most sophisticated and most advanced i am talking about compared to all the other markets in the payment space look at reserve bank of india it's now starting you know in sand it's running sandboxes for innovations in the payment space you know in the last um, i think week or week before it has it has um, allowed certain uh, certain innovation in that space uh, including one which is a voice based uh, credit uh, credit uh, appraisal uh, so lot of things are happening we cannot uh, keep our eyes closed so this decade will be a decade of disruptions definitely this decade will be different and i'll quote one um, i often say that uh, till recently the bankers were were pretty were pretty uh i'd say smart got pretty confident about themselves because what will these guys do because they don't have the they don't have the uh, customers we have the customers because all this you know entities um, all your technology guys and all they believe in this ott model you know over the top so what does it mean you need to have a structure to ride on like for instance whatsapp whatsapp is riding on the telecom structure similarly right. all these guys will come and ride on a banking structure now the choice before the bank is whether i will allow them to disrupt myself or i will disrupt myself so that's the choice the banks are running and it's becoming more complicated i am not getting into all this blockchain and cloud computing all those technicalities ai and robotics and all they are all part of it but the main theme is the of the decade will be disruption and what is happening is this the bankers talk look i am pretty confident they cannot do much if i do this up myself because i have my own customer base it may not hold true because along it so far it was only fintech but now tech fins are coming like facebook is coming like amazon is coming and they have their customer base true so we we have to see this now do we see in a in a country like india do we get this digital bank which the china has Or, or the atom kind of thing. I don't think we have, uh, because as you rightly said, our literacy is very different. Our internet language is continues to be not too many in the in the in the hinterland. The localization of language is not happening at all. And then also the trust factor, etc., etc. Because I don't think you can only digitally you go and you you get a bank done. Because then probably the um, uh, your guys will take money. Uh, but will not uh, return your money because uh, they don't know you they don't they need to touch and feel so i think india will continue to be at this at this next five years continue to be you call it uh, take and touch kind of thing or digital both physical and digital and all we can't be overnight but overall this is going to be uh, uh, is a is a is a is a is a decade of disruption and the banks probably need to 
HDM, they can't be in a denial mode anymore. Like I will not name some of the banks. Uh, probably will become irrelevant. The, the new, the younger, the millennials. Why would they go? Because bank is most of them, the the entire payment system and and the app etc. The bank you are carrying in your pocket, right? Your Correct. mobile. So if you don't follow that, uh, but the smart ones, clever ones, I think will not give up the physical thing also. Um, so the branches will take a different format. There will be not large branches. There will be a very small one-person managed bank or two-person managed branches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think in the next five years, at least, we will see the take and touch or touch and tick, depending on uh, the bank and digital. But overall theme for this current decade will be disruption, and the banks better accept it and change the way they work. Sure. So the last one before, yeah. absolutely yeah. before we turn it to yeah. Mohit. Then. Yeah. Yep. Are you taking one more question, or because we have so, one question? Yeah. We'll ask, which sounds a little <laughs> cheeky. Uh, uh, this is from Mr. Ramaswamy, who says, "We seem to be an evergreen economy." Banks evergreening loans, government itself evergreening provident fund, new depositors evergreening old deposits. When does it all stop? I, I don't honestly. I'm not qualified. It's it's, <laughs> it's interesting to hear, but I'm not qualified to answer this. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Mohit, over to you. Mohit, over to you. You know, this question actually brings it to the conclusion, and it also brings me to the last epilogue of the of the book. and i would like to quote it from the warren buffet's quote that tamalda has used very beautifully which is about a hurricane that came in 1992 and warren buffet commented after that uh, the comment is uh, it is only when the tide goes out that you learn who's been swimming naked and we have to wait for the tide to go over and i think the last question that you just asked shridhar we have to wait for the tide to go over whoever is naked because there's so many naked <laughs> and usually this term is used in the stock broking business and we have seen many of these crash crashes where people have actually over optimized their limits but certainly that's exactly how the banking also looks to many of us when we read his book it's an eye opener it's an eye opener where is my money going where is the tax payers money going and why is it so that the government needs to be in the in the business of banking which definitely brings out the beautiful assessment that tamalda has done and lovely comparison of how the money if reinvested back into the economy for good purposes would have uh, reaped in more benefits so with this i think um, i would just like to say this is a beautiful book should be part of the course curriculum across um, i would always refer this book whenever i have to see this period of the banking till 2020 um, thanks to you tamalda for um, gracing the platform so well and uh, addressing the community thanks to you shridhar for such lovely meticulous preparation and uh, bringing so much out of uh, the discussion we still couldn't take few of the questions for which we really apologize but certainly um, everything has a time limit um, today we have actually stretched by 20 minutes though we usually don't and this book is definitely something which i'm sure um, your spouses will fight once you once you pick up the book and even on the dining table you will not leave this book and <laughs> this is that kind of a thriller Uh, thank you very much thanks for everyone who joined in today thanks for gracing the case and truly a pleasure thank you tamalda thank you trilar thank you truly thank you stay thank you. stay, thank stay you. safe and a happy 2021 thank you uh, to Thank you, you. namaskar sir thank you